Yeah, no worries. Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, bringing back downtown retail after COVID-19. Uh, my name is Brandon Hofsted and I am the Community Economic Development Program Manager with the University of Wisconsin Division of Extension. Uh, and it is my pleasure uh, to open this webinar and to welcome hundreds of uh, fellow participants from over 100 different communities from across the United States um, and many from Wisconsin in particular. Today's webinar is focused on revitalizing downtowns in our mid-sized and small communities with the goal of examining important questions related to retail uh, in our downtowns. We will hear from three downtown, re downtown and retail experts who will help explore answers to these questions. And um, it promises, I, I promise to you, that it will be lively and an engaging conversation. Um, and before we begin, I would like to offer a special thank you to, uh, uh, to acknowledge our co-sponsor, event co-sponsor, the American Downtown Revitalization Review, or the ADRR. Um, we will hear a little bit more from uh, one of the founders um, uh, in a little bit later. Um, also, we're, many of us are pros at this point with doing online Zoom uh, etiquette, but just for a reminder, um, uh, there are just a couple of housekeeping uh, uh, points. Um, a friendly reminder to please keep your microphones muted when you're not speaking. Um, we will be taking questions at the later part of the program, um, and once our moderator opens the floor for Q&A, uh, you can either use your raise hand function, which you can find at the bottom of the screen, or you can post something in the chat, um, and then we will make sure to either respond to you via chat, uh, or we will uh, have the moderator call on you. Um, and we do have a couple of folks that will be monitoring both of those, so um, your questions won't be missed. So without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce our moderator today, a colleague of mine, Bill Ryan. Uh, many of you know Bill, but Bill is a community uh, business development specialist with UW-Madison uh, Extension. Bill has over 20 years of experience working with local economic development professionals, municipal planners, and interested residents um, in the state of Wisconsin and actually from across the United States to help improve downtown and commercial districts. As a statewide specialist, Bill provides practical, locally-based research and educational program, programming to inform community planning and investment. Uh, and today, as I said before, uh, Bill will actually act as the moderator and referee if needed. Um, so with that, Bill, I will turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Brandon. For those from small cities and towns in Wisconsin and the Midwest, less than 75,000 people, the past 20 years have been dominated by Walmart supercenters, chains like Walgreens, convenience stores like Quick Trip, dollar stores, a mix of independent businesses, and of course, the internet. Warehouse clubs have also taken off in larger metropolitan areas. Challenges facing the small rural community, populations less than 25,000, have been the availability of land that encourages edge of town development. As a result, there isn't as much attention placed on encouraging dense downtown development, especially in the smaller rural community. Given all this, the question of today is what kinds of retail can we expect in our smaller downtowns as we recover from this very stressful COVID-19 crisis? I'm delighted to be the moderator to these, for these talented people today. Before we get going, one last item I'd like to just bring up here about the introduction. If it's hard to hear me or I talk too fast or garble my words, I probably am, uh, or my posture leads me to slip down to my chair, which has happened in the past, let Brandon or Melissa or Laurie know via the chat box. Uh, or just unmute yourself and let me let me know, speak up. This is my eighth year with Parkinson's disease, and I'm determined not to let it get in our way today. So let's have a good dialogue and um, any kind of uh, misunderstanding or can't hear me, just let us know and we'll we'll fix that right away. So I, I'm going to start with our, our first speaker. Um, and what we're going to do is have three questions that will be that will guide our conversation. And for each question, I'll, I'll read it out loud and call on a panelist to start the conversation. And they're gonna speak for maybe two or three minutes knowing that uh, we'll come back later if they wanna to add to what they're gonna say. So um, in total, they have up to five minutes of, of response to the question. But we're gonna start with just a first two or three minute uh, introduction response to the question. Uh, the first question says, where will retail be in downtowns like ours as we recover from this very stressful crisis? And the uh, retail here is defined as, uh, you can define it however you want, just retail products, products, uh, are produced or including food and beverage. So um, Kristen Fish Peterson is a partner at Redevelopment Resources in Madison. Kristen describes herself as being geeky passionate about redevelopment in downtowns. Kristen has a special base of knowledge around economic development finance. 
What's unique about Kristen is her disciplined consulting services that lead to innovative recommendations for a community and the next step to help them implement those recommendations. Her ability to speak to so fluently about financial programs demonstrate her readiness to, get, to getting products, projects in the ground. And so Kristen, if you can spend about two or three minutes and just share some of your responses to the question about where will retail be downtown in places like ours uh, in the, in the um, stress after the stressful crisis that we've gone through. Go ahead. Thank you, Bill. Thanks for allowing me to be with these fine panelists today. Um, I think we've seen, I, I, I feel fairly um, comfortable about where retail will be. It's a key component of any downtown. And um, I think that as economic development practitioners, many of us have to focus on our actions in order to facilitate and help foster retail downtown, but I'm encouraged. Um, I think retailers are doing all right in that, you know, the, the lockdowns had them spinning, but they quickly pivoted. They learned how to use the internet if they didn't already make, have that as a part of their um, multi-channel um, reaching out to their customer base. Um, so they got adept at social media, online order taking, um, fulfilling orders through um, parking lot pickup. Um, I do want to share that Redevelopment Resources administers the Central Wisconsin Revolving Loan Fund, which is a 12 or 10 county, um, $12 million fund in Central Wisconsin. And when the pandemic hit, we had 62 active loans. And of those, um, only tw uh, 20 asked for deferrals. And each of those <clears throat> have now been, success after 90 days, most of them were off the deferral period. And a lot of them were um, restaurants, breweries, microbreweries, um, distilleries, not a lot of retailers. Um, so the other, the other key component was the service related businesses. They needed a deferral. Um, but I, you know, not a lot of retailers were asking for deferrals because they, I think, were very resilient. There are a lot of things that, um, practitioners can do to help keep their businesses in downtown. And I'll talk about that a little later. So I, I won't um, continue to continue to talk now. I'll let Michael or David take a turn at this question. Thanks, Kristen. Michael Byrne with MJB Consulting in New York City and San Francisco is our next speaker. Um, retail planning and real estate consulting, he's been doing this since, 19, since 2002. For Michael, retail is critical as it is the first in, and only land use that everyone can see as they enter town and assess what's going on in town. Michael has been working extensively throughout the US, Canada, and the UK. He serves both private and public sector clients. He's hired to undertake market analyses, devise strategies for retail, lead workshops, advise on land use and zoning policy, as well as spearhead implementation and recruitment efforts. Michael focuses primarily on downtown, Main Street, and neighborhood business districts from large cities to small towns, including many places in the Midwest. Michael, what's your reaction to the question, where will retail be in downtowns like ours after we recover from this stressful crisis? Yeah, it's, um, you know, I, at first I'd, I'd like to say, I, I wouldn't in any way want my remarks to, um, to convey any sort of minimizing of what this experience has been for individuals and individual business owners. I would say on the whole, uh, all three of us on the panel uh, are pleasantly surprised that this was not the uh, extinction level event that I think a lot of us were fearing back in the spring of 2020. Um, uh, certainly not for downtowns and main streets. Um, actually, uh, it, what's been quite striking um, is how well they've gotten through this, all things considered. Um, just a couple points I want to make, and, and I'm sure David will have some things to say on them, but I think both or all three of us kind of agree that restaurants in particular have gotten the lion's share of attention. Um, and uh, and, and if, if you actually look at the data, um, have emerged from this quite well. And part of that is like Chris, Kristen was saying about, about pivoting. Um, Part of it was that they're very good at lobbying um, and they lobbied to the hilt 
and used scare tactics and ultimately got what they wanted and, and did need. Uh, if you look at this restaurant revitalization fund, um, for instance, which only a fraction of restaurants actually um, were able to take advantage of, um, but still was remarkably generous. Um, and I think that's part of the reason restaurants have, 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 have emerged um, as they have. Um, but two other points I did want to make, um, and, and I'm sure we'll get into a lot of this, whenever we're talking about retail and whenever we're talking about downtown retail, I think the elephant in the room is always e-commerce um, and, uh, and what impact that's going to have. Uh, and I tend to take uh, I tend to take a somewhat contrarian position on this. Um, I actually think um, uh, that there's an inherent unsustainability to e-commerce um, on the cost side of things, um, and that unsustainability is even more acute in smaller markets um, for reasons I can get into. And that uh, you know even on the demand side, um, uh, whenever people talked about how little we were actually shopping last year, how we weren't buying clothing and shoes and, and, and soft goods. The assumption was that, oh, it's because we're not going out. We're not going to events. We're not going to parties. We're not going to the office. And that's undoubtedly part of it. But I think another big part of it is that we couldn't go to the store. And that's how we still prefer to buy those items. Um, uh, so I think both on the cost side for businesses, as well as on the demand side for consumers, um, we're going to hit a ceiling when it comes to e-commerce. Uh, one can argue that we're already approaching it. Um, and that the last point I want to make is that downtown specifically, we, we've been in this fight for a while. Um, downtowns have been fighting for relevance for at least 70 years now, right? 60, 70 years. It was first with the malls, then, especially in smaller markets, it's, it was with Walmart, um, and now it's with e-commerce. But in the course of those, er, those two earlier rounds of adaptation, we learned a few things. And we happened upon a formula which clearly was working and, and should work again, um, even in the aftermath of this pandemic. And I would actually submit that the threat of e-commerce is far more acute for shopping centers than it is for downtowns and main streets because downtowns and main streets long ago figured out they couldn't compete on the same turf. They had to double down on what made them unique. And I think that remains a competitive advantage against the online threat, just as it was ultimately against malls uh, and Walmart. Um, and we could talk some more about that, but um, just some food for thought. Uh, that actually uh, downtowns and the main streets are not the most vulnerable. And as I'll talk about later, that creates opportunities, um, some very interesting opportunities uh, for what downtown retail could be and become. Thank you, Michael. Makes me take notes here about the past of downtowns and what yeah. kind of experiences we've had. And do we want to be like that again or not? Um, so thank you very much. Our, our next commentary will be from David Milder, president of the New York-based Dant Incorporated. He's also the founder of the American Downtown Revitalization Review. This journal is capturing in the creative thinking of people like Kristen and Michael. Uh, oftentimes, they are will, be, will challenge our views on downtown. Um, David has advanced the study of, co in co of concepts like central social districts, niche markets, arts and entertainment, and e-commerce. Since 1977, David has worked with big cities and small towns. He's taken a fond liking for Wisconsin, I think, um, and urban cities and rural communities across the nation. I've known David for a number of years, and every time I speak with him, I walk away with new insight, and I really appreciate that, David. Uh, David's going to talk a little bit uh, briefly about uh, the, uh, the ADRR publication and the journal, and uh, then get into his uh, initial comments on question number one. David? Well, the ADRR was founded to provide a place where kind of uh, really deep discussions, uh, honest uh, discussions about the problems and opportunities that are facing our downtowns can take place, getting away from what so often transpires at our conventions, which is we hear success story after success story, rah, rah, good news, but we really don't get into issues and it seems to be a sin if you disagree with somebody. Oh, oh unprofessional, blah, blah, blah. 
uh, or to have uh, contrary views presented. And also, you know, out on the West Coast in Silicon Valley, Valley, failures are deemed as a learning experience and you put them on your, uh, on your Vita. It, within the downtown community, nobody wants to talk about uh, our, our failures, but they are perhaps some of the play, uh, uh, experiences from which we can learn most about what we should be doing in the future. And one of the we tr things we try and do at the, at the ADR was, we, is we emphasize discussions while we do articles, traditional kind of journal articles. We also get into things like webinars and, and other things. And we try and bring our discussions not only to our website, but to other opportunities such as this one. So that is uh, enough about the ADR and I hope you will become a re reader. Just uh, Google the ADRR.com and you can get to our site and sign up for our mailing list so you don't have to worry about keeping abreast of our latest content that we post. So Bill, let me get to my response to this question. And I have a, a, a kind of a, 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 a riff off of, of the other two presentations because well, I certainly agree that we're far better off than where we thought we would be. Uh, what I'm seeing uh, is that there's a lot of vary, there's going to be a lot of variation. I'll ask Lori to put up my first slide, uh, a graphic about the recession has nearly ended for high wage earners. Uh, and what we're seeing is that across the country, uh, there's been a kind of uh, difference in where people, how people are doing. Uh, and it's really forcing uh, the, this kind of in economic inequality issue quite a bit. And a key variable is that households um, up above 60,000 a year in income seem to have done much better or are doing much better in terms of keeping their jobs, keeping their incomes. And they are, as a, because of the way that the whole uh, um, uh, constricted activity opportunity of the, of the crisis has emerged. They have not been spending as much, so they've been accumulating a lot of discretionary dollars. Uh, and uh, they're coming out of this recession uh, quite well. In fact, one thing on Bloomberg recently says that Gen Xers have doubled their wealth during the recession, during the recession, this recession. And on the other end, what we have is those who are, are low, have low wage employment. And uh, they are, have, uh, look, have, been, uh, have much higher unemployment, tougher time uh, uh, keeping jobs. And it's not, I guess, of course, we have this whole uh, job thing, which uh, uh, people not wanting to take jobs, which is a whole separate issue that we should get, be getting into uh, uh, perhaps later on. Um, but they, are, they have less income. And although the government uh, uh, subsidies for the crisis have helped uh, ameliorate much of that in many instances. Um, uh, th that those subsidies are 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 are, wear, are wearing thin. Uh, I'm looking for, uh, for instance, things like I think that the post-crisis um, uh, suburbs that are have affluent uh, trade areas and uh, are have urbanized style towns. Um, they are the ones that may be entering in a, into a period of like a new golden age uh, because they, their residents and their downtown populations are going to be filled with new uh, um, people with uh, 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 pent up demand, uh, available dollars to spend, and they're going to have a larger daytime population because of more remotes living in um, the, uh, um, their areas. In smaller and less affluent downtowns, they were having problems before the crisis, and those problems are, are probably been somewhat exasperated by the crisis. And the thing about their, them in many instances is the retail is not the problem, the, the main problem. It, the problem is their economies. As long as their economies are inhibited, they're usually in metro, metro areas that uh, are, are not doing as well economically as the larger metro areas. So that is having a constraining effect on what their retail can be. It was that before the crisis, it's going to be that after the crisis. And a key thing that they've always had is they, they have had small, relatively small 
retail market areas <laughs> and populations and small employment areas. And the challenge, I think, uh, in, in the post-crisis era is for them to be able to overcome those crises, that those inhibiting barriers by using the internet in, in various ways. And finally, I think, question. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were ready for a question. <laughs> just one, 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 one thing. Uh, I think the other thing that's important about the crisis is that's really shown in many places the importance of strong public pla uh, places to keeping tr downtown traffic uh, occurring. Chris, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I agree with you about downtown um, places, but your your graph here shows that low wage employment is down. And it feels like staffing in retail and restaurants is the biggest challenge that they have to keeping their doors open right now. So have you done any research or have any data related to that? Because I even spoke with a restaurateur yesterday who wants to sell his business because it's, he and his wife are being run ragged. Um, they just don't have the staff right now. No, I, I, I have not. Uh, I, I'm aware of the situation. I think everybody's aware of the situation. OK, I think that. Uh, um, if the data on this or really having a kind of realistic and honest um, a kind of research framework to look at it, uh, because I think what we have is a lot of people are really kind of uh, 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 have this kind of adopt this kind of YOLO effect of, you know, you only live once and they're reevaluating whether they want to commit their life to to non, you know, dead end jobs or non, -end, or at least try something else. I don't know. I don't think we fully explored this uh, and what's happening. But plainly, also, there's a, uh, it's not only this kind of uh, uh, quality of life aspect to it, but there's a plain remuneration aspect of it. Is that that they they are very low paying jobs. They often do not treat the workers are not treated very well. The working conditions are, are not great. And restaurants are famous for this. I hate to say this, uh, you know, uh, I've worked with a lot of restaurants uh, um, and my, my father used to be a, a wine salesman. So we would get to know the restaurant tours and, and I know a lot of chefs and they all say the same thing. Uh, so this is a very hard thing to go through, but I do think that this is going to be an encumbrance for, for them. Uh, on the other hand, I think a lot of them are finding out that didn't need as much staff as they thought they did. I think that we're getting a rationalization, that, but we're jumping ahead here. Okay, uh, I think that they're going to find. I think this is true of both the retailers and the restaurants is that they're going to find that they've gone lean and they've discovered new ways of operating that they don't have to go as robust as they were before. Well, uh, if I could throw something in there, and, and Bill, please uh, preempt me if I'm getting us. Uh, off track because now we have two other questions. Um, but on this labor shortage issue, you know, and, and certainly uh, restaurants and bars and also shops are dealing not just with the labor shortage, but you know, rising costs in other areas related to supply chain challenges. I'm curious to see how much of this is really structural and how much of it is a temporary dislocation. Because to be quite honest, I don't know what we expected. We were through 18 months of pure craziness as an economy, as a, as a national economy, as a global economy. Um, I don't know why people necessarily expected that it would all just go back to normal. Um, I think these are temporary... I, I, I don't think we've necessarily seen data to suggest that it's not a temporary dislocation that will ultimately resolve itself. Um, that, I guess, just remains to be seen. Um, it, you know, I'm curious to see what happens as kids are going back to school, um, uh, you know, and, and whether that changes the labor shortage. Um, uh, I don't know if we can necessarily leap to the assumption um, that it's because wages aren't high enough or these workers are treated poorly. Those, that, those might be true. I'm just saying, I'm not sure that's necessarily uh, the decisive driver here. Um, and I think we need to wait a little while to see how it all plays out. I, I think, Mike, I, I agree that we uh, certainly, that, that we, we, we don't know enough to see how it's gonna play out, but we, have, we are beginning to, uh, identify some variables that ought to be looked looked into uh, you know mm -hmm. we're doing a kind of qualitative process here that starts at initial stages of any good research 
Yeah. But I, I also want to stress, I think that we have to look at this technological stuff mm -hmm. uh, because there are a number of things that are occurring within kitchens and with de deliveries and other things that really uh, pose an, a, a possibility of taking a sizable chunk out of the need for labor. Yeah. And, and I think you know, the restaurant industry is really in, beginning to invest a lot of resources in that. And that's something that may also impact on this. I shouldn't be asking questions, but I do have one question that kind of wraps up this, this slide here. Is the difference between the, the green bar, the green line and the red line due in part to the number of positions, jobs that are work at home type jobs? Uh, yes, uh, the, uh, very, uh, the, the reason why the 60K plus uh, I've kept their employment is that so much, so many of them were able to do remote work. These are, this is where the white collar uh, uh, workers are, 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 are basically clustered. And, and, and the lower income people are, are, and the essential workers are not able to do the remote work. Any more comments about question number one? I have one, um, but uh, Kristen, did you want to say something first? I didn't want to preempt you. Um, yeah, I think this is just taking off from from something that David said um, about uh, you know the the imminent golden age of suburban downtowns, and I I would uh, I would concur that the you know there's certainly been a lot of increased and uh, built up wealth in especially more affluent suburban downtowns of major metropolitan areas. I think also more broadly though, um, there's, there's demographic shift um, that needs to be accounted for so that you get the retail mix right in those suburban downtowns. Um, one thing that we've been seeing uh, in the last five to 10 years, especially in, in, in the suburbs of large metropolitan areas, but increasingly in, 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 you know, in the suburbs of secondary cities, is this sort of suburbanization of hip, is what I call it. And I think what's driving that is all these millennials that we've been hearing about for 10, 20 years, trying to figure out what they think, what they want, how they consume. Well, they're entering that life stage where they are indeed forming families and relocating to suburbs, right? Just like, just like um, people in that life stage have done in this country for decades. The difference is that unlike previous suburbanizers, they're taking their urban sensibilities with them. And exactly. so you're seeing in these retail mixes, uh, the kinds of business that, I don't know, I never grew up with in my New York City suburb, um, uh, whether it's artisanal coffee houses or brew pubs or retro men's barber shops or artisanal this, craft that. I didn't grow up with those uh, in Westchester County in the suburbs of New York City. Um, and I think that's something which is clearly um, changing the way our retail mixes look and feel in these suburban downtowns. And I think the retail mixes have to keep, uh, keep up with that. Or, or accommodate that, um, in some cases better than they have thus far. Um, so I think on the whole, I agree with the, with the comment about suburban downtowns, but I think there is a demographic shift here, which was happening anyway, pandemic or not. And I think the pandemic accelerated a little bit, but a lot of that suburban migration during the pandemic was just pulled forward um, in demographic term. And demographically, it was gonna happen regardless, just because millennials are such a major demographic bulge in the market it's not it's not it's no fun doing this but i agree with you on that and uh, <laughs> and um you know uh, I, I i call them urbanized downtowns and, and and they're the ones that also tend to have the uh the successful theaters for instance that are rare uh, fairly uh the very robust restaurant niches you know uh, one of the towns that we know of has over, over 70 eating places and they're averaging close to a million a piece um and, you know and uh this is all they're more like um the way i think of mike is they're more like a, a, a robust big city neighborhoods like williamsburg forest hills you know stuff like that uh, on a miniature and uh i, I think they're they're going to be doing really well in the future Okay, team, I'll tell you what, I'm going to be aggressive here and ask that we kind of focus back on the heartland of the, of the U.S., the Midwest here. 
and uh, focus on some of our smaller communities. Um, and I'm gonna jump into the next question here. And that is, what are the best opportunities for regaining and possibly increasing the strength of our downtown retailing? So if we can define what we say as retailing and then think in terms of the Midwest, towns of 5,000 to 25,000 to 50,000. And uh, you know, what are the best opportunities for regaining traffic downtown? And who do we want to go first? Anyone have a preference? I want you to start off. Okay. Um, yeah, and I, I think it's important to pull back to Midwest. I do think that phenomenon applies or could apply specifically to suburbs outside Milwaukee or Madison, but um, I, I think it's good to pull back. Um, you know, I think in terms of the opportunities, uh, um, I tend to be quite bullish and believe it or not, even bullish when it comes to shopping in our suburban and small town downtowns. Um, and, and this gets to something that I was kind of uh, alluding to earlier, um, that if you, you know, if, if you think that the online threat is most, uh, most dangerous to shopping centers, um, uh, you know, we've obviously seen uh, in the last five years, a lot of well-known brands uh, disappear or shrink considerably, right? If you, uh, you know, even smaller markets, you know, Christopher and Banks is no longer with us. Justice is no longer with us. Obviously, Sears and um, Sears have disappeared left and right. Um, and I mention all that not because, um, not because those brands were in downtowns, because rare they never they rarely were, but that their disappearance creates a void, right? Creates a void which boutiques can can step into. And if you doubt me, think about the evolution of the bookseller industry, where we had Barnes and Noble and Borders, right? Then we had Amazon. Uh, um, borders disappeared. Barnes and Noble is probably about half its size. So there was a void, right? And what stepped into that void? Well, what's fascinating is between 2010 and 2020, every year, year over year, there was a rise in the number of independent bookstores store, across the country. Um, so that in the 2010s, there was actually a 50% overall increase in the number of independent bookstores in the United States. And guess what happened by the end of that? Amazon started opening bookstores, right? My point is that there was a void created by what Amazon did to the marketplace. And independent booksellers, the sorts that we see in downtowns and on main streets, they stepped into that void. And I wonder now as we lose the Christopher and Banks and we lose the Sears and we lose the Children's Place or closing many stores, or we lose a lot of uh, Victoria's Secret stores, are there boutiques on our, in our downtown the matrix that can step into that void, right? Um, and then, the, you know, and, and, and so that's one area where I think with shop, shops, um, there's opportunity. Another opportunity is that it's clear that we as consumers prefer to do our treasure hunting in store, not online. Um, we see that in the continued success of off-price retailing, the rise of consignment, and 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 um, and recycled clothing, um, all of that. Even we're even seeing that to some degree, um, you know, with certain brands like Five Below, for instance, or um, you know, uh, Dollar Tree's new um, it's pop shelf concept. Um, treasure hunting is clearly something we want to do, and we prefer to do in person. And any retail concept that approximates that experience or that delivers that experience um, is going to be an area of opportunity. Um, I'd be interested in, um, and I'm sure Kristen, you'll, you'll have some more things to say in this. Um, I'm interested to hear uh, what you think on that. Um, and then the last point about the opportunities is that um, obviously food and beverage um, seems to be primed to continue. Uh, it's, it's, it's role as kind of the driver for a lot of our downtowns and main streets. Um, it might take different form. There seems to be still a lot more runway left for 
for for for craft brewing and and, and craft alcohol of various kinds. Um, but I think also um, just thinking more generally about the experiential component of retail, um, uh, that there's an ever uh, ever diversifying array of entertainment concepts that 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 we're seeing. Right. So originally uh, we became familiar with the paint and sip studio where you 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 went uh, and learned how to paint while drinking a glass of wine. Well, that has evolved to the point where now we have um, uh, uh, studios where you can go paint wood signs. And now you're starting to see studios where you can create your own candles. Right. Um, my point is that this is an ever evolving space. And a lot of these concepts, even if they're not exclusive to downtowns and main streets, they certainly um, are willing to consider those locations and able to thrive in those locations. So I think if you put together all of these different opportunities, there's, there's quite a lot, a, quite a wide range of tenants that downtowns and main streets um, um, should be able to, to land. And so I'm, I'm sure a lot of you hear lots of, lots of uh, tales of woe from your local brokers and landlords. Um, and obviously it depends on the specific market you're talking about, but I don't buy the notion that there's nothing out there looking for space. Uh, on the contrary, last year has been uh, great for new small businesses. There, and there are a lot of entrepreneurs that are sensing this moment as an opportunity, um, uh, you know, to, to so, uh, so I'm not quite buying those tales of woe or, or again, that varies by, by market, but um, there, there, there are uh, directions that tenant can, tenanting can take if you're hot to the trends and creative in your thinking. So Thank leave. you, Michael. Yep. David or, or Kristen, do you have, have a response or a additional thought? Kristen, go ahead. Yes, I have all kinds of thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> um, first, I wanted to address Spencer Gober's question in the chat. Um, definitely housing needs to be a component. Um, and if your community has upper story residential that's not being utilized, we need to figure out how to get that to become active because that's one of your best opportunities to get uh, shoppers downtown, people who are using the downtown for more than just shopping. They're living there, they're eating there, they're buying their insurance there, they're getting their haircuts there. So um, for sure. Um, Lori, if you could put up my first graphic, please. I, I want to quickly go through that. Um, that one, thank you. So I think that one of the key, care, key things about um, a successful retailer downtown is its operating characteristics. Really, um, I see categories of retail that are successful. I see retailers that are successful, but it's it's 99% about the operator and then having the right product in the right place. So they have to have quality products and services um, at a unique product offering. They have to offer customer service. Um, locally owned and operated directly to what Mike was saying about the chains. Um, the chains are not locally owned and operated. They're not, they, they're not as invested in the community, but if you have a locally owned and operated retailer in your downtown, um, that's a key success characteristic for, um, for a retailer or a restaurant or any kind of business actually. Um, located in historic buildings is a a, a nice to have. Not all buildings are historic in downtowns, but that's that's a great um, contributing factor to their success. Um, and being place-based, um, this ties into um, David's point about the central social district. Um, it, it's just it, it's just what other factors in your community can help bring success to that retailer. Um, Lori, if you could go to the next slide, I'd like to share from personal experience, um, this, this one right here, thank you. Um, this is my opinion of categories with a likelihood of succeeding in downtown. And this has been developed over years of actually recruiting businesses to downtown. Um, I also have a real estate license in the state of Wisconsin and I focus on commercial, but um, when redevelopment resources has been 
on occasion retained by a community to act as an extension of their staff in, in an economic development capacity. Um, and that's happened in cases like Pulaski, Merrill, Rothschild, Watertown. Um, we work toward recruiting businesses to, biz to buildings in the downtown. And I've put a lot of thought into what would be recession proof? What does a community need that they might not necessarily buy online? What, what do they want to shop for in their own community? Um, and I've been surprised by a few of these, in, especially ice cream. And I'll tell a story in Deerfield, Wisconsin, um, uh, a chocolate shop ice cream store was put up. An operator wanted to sell the brand in Wisconsin that if you're familiar with chocolate shop, my, my favorite ice cream. Um, and, and Deerfield is this tiny town and they opened um, over a year ago, well, before the pandemic, and they are they are so successful in this small town selling ice cream in downtown and, and that's all they sell in that store. So I was very surprised that they've been successful and, ex and excited about it. Um, but I think, you know, to, to Mike's point, the clothing boutiques, the experiential retail, something um, to give a buyer or a shopper more than just the experience they would get online. Um, some of these things are are necessary, but you know, home health aids or pharmacy is a convenience factor. Health specialties such as physical therapy clinics, um, hearing aid, you know, services, pretty much. But to have a mix, um, I think these, um, this, this, these nine categories to me are are my go-to categories when I try to start recruiting retail to downtown businesses. So downtown buildings. Anyway, I will let David take it from here. I can just jump Thanks. in real fast. Uh, these uh, nine items reflect David's work on niche development real closely. So maybe Dave, you want to touch on that? Well, actually what I wanted to do, Bill, is to uh, uh, talk about um, the, uh, the uh, central social districts because a number of the, 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 the types of operations that Kristen identify really fall within that. Yeah. Uh, you know, typically we tend uh, a lot of people when they talk about uh, retail, uh, they um, uh, they they have a they think that's the key factor for downtown uh, success, and uh, also that you know the primary thing, frankly, is apparel uh, for some reason, and 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 maybe a grocery store, mm -hmm. uh, but there are a lot of and. And when uh, many places that I visited, when they talk about a retail problem, what they're talking about isn't a retail problem, it's a, um, a general just storefront problem. And this is, I think Mike is alluding to this, you know, uh, one of your graduate students did a, a study of uh, towns of under 20,000 in Wisconsin. And, the, and uh, for those under 10,000, I think he, John identified that only about 14% of them are retail. And so in the town like of in under 20,000, they may have nine retail stores. Well, all the rest of them are in other things. And those are the things that are probably uh, where most of the vacancies lie and, and you have to uh, 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 really look at it. And uh, one of the things that your, your research again did before, Bill, I hate to keep on coming back to you on this, okay? Uh, is that you had identified kinds of functions that fit into what I call central social district, which is, is not a, a, a kind of office and work and wealth creation, but has to do with how we live, live a quality of life, how we come down to downtowns to live, work, and play rather than to work and make money. Um, and uh, what I found was out of your data that about in, in towns under 20,000 20, uh, that uh, about 55% of the retail and uh, uh, service businesses fit within the, the, the uh, uh, central social district uh, category. And two of the prominent ones are there. One is, of course, you know, the restaurants and, 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 and watering holes. But another one is what I call pamper niches, okay? Um, these are things like uh, hair and beauty salons. <laughs> um, uh, martial arts studios, Pilates studios, dance studios. And these are the ones that are really low cost to start. They don't take much capital uh, to begin with. They don't take much maintenance. Uh, they can fit in on side streets, et cetera. 
uh, so what in, in small towns, these are very early. They, uh, they don't need a lot of market share uh, to survive. These are often uh, early, uh, uh, make early appearances and, and uh, are, uh, uh, these should be cared for because um, they are the ones that bring in uh, people with a lot of uh, discretionary dollars to spend. Uh, the second thing about uh, um, um, uh, central social district operations is that they bring people downtown. Uh, and that I think is a, a thing that as an objective, too many downtown leaders don't uh, pay enough attention to that creating traffic downtown, increasing your daytime population is really a critical variable. And to think of, you know, if you do that, then your retail and, and your other, and, your, and the tenants in your stores are going to do much better uh, if you can facilitate that and goose that along. And uh, that brings me to another part of, of the uh, central social district, which are the public spaces. And I, I hate to say this, but, you know, I think a lot of downtowns in the uh, below 75,000 have very, very uh, poor uh, um, public spaces, if any. Uh, and when they do have them, they locate them in either uh, the periphery of the downtown or in a, 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 a off main corridor location, like um, 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 my daughter lives in Downers Grove, Illinois, and they have a marvelous park with a huge amphitheater, but you can't see it from Main Street. It's one block over. So any activity there has no impact on the, on the retailers that are on a Main Street. What you need is your public spaces to be in a central location, and you need them to, to be programmed that, that are targeted at the, the, the major downtown daytime population segments, which are the people who work there, senior, active seniors, uh, adults with preschool children, uh, junior high school and high school uh, uh, students, now uh, uh, and, and, and uh, possible visitors to the downtown. And what's enriching that mix in a lot of downtowns now as a post-crisis thing is the number of, of uh, remote workers who are in the, in the mix because these are both residents and workers. So the, the people who live and work in your downtown are gonna spend a lot more money in the store than the average person who just lives in, 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 uh, in the store. So I think these are opportunities that, that uh, are, are, are should be uh, uh, re really uh, looked at um, Closely, uh, uh, the housing comment is absolutely you know part of this uh, CSD kind of uh, outlook and analysis viewpoint, uh, and in particular, I think that bringing um, um, a seniors housing downtown uh, can be very very uh, uh, um, have a, a lot of create a lot of impact because they will spend more time they can spend more time downtown. And uh, uh, they, you know, they're not away at work. They have more time for, that's free. Even just them sitting outside close to near the downtown space can get, help to create a, a, a feeling of activity that is, that, is, that is necessary. Same thing with things like uh, the over, often overlooked aspect of another aspect of the central social district. And something that we also have an emerging problem with is childcare. Uh, you know, we have we have child care and we have, I live next to Clo uh, Forest Park and we have a lot of child care being done in the park. And what I see is so many people just stop and watch the kids and the seniors love to watch the kids. And there's a kind of symbiosis between that, et cetera, that is both enjoyable and nice to look at, but it also gives a sense of activity. And that activity helps to show that downtown is alive and we produce that, you're going to get more people coming to downtown. And that, I hate to be so, you know, many stepped into this, that helps to feed your, your, your store uh, occupant, the tenants. Thank you, David. Uh, it's um, looking at the time, we have about uh, 10 minutes before our first hour is up. The first hour is, is the pre presentation by the panel here. Then the next half an hour, if you stay on, it's going to be more participation and question and answer from the people attending online. Um, so I encourage you to stay on. We have a good uh, stay on factor right now, 128 people still with us. Um, as an incentive for you to stay on to the very end, uh, we have um, a book that we're going to uh, give away 
to uh, the first and second uh, people to answer some questions for us. So hang in there. And um, I think if it's okay with the panel, let's go ahead and work on the third question, okay? Uh, and that question is, what strategies, projects, and programs can help us achieve <clears throat> these, potential, these potentials? And those potentials are regaining and increasing the strength of our downtown retailing. So what strategies, projects, and programs can we implement that will help us strengthen our downtown retailing? And we'll go until about uh, half an hour, or actually 15 minutes. Okay, I'll, I'll, take a, I'll take a stab at, at this. Uh, I, I, I just want to really um, um, I want to emphasize just one point. I asked Lori to put up my slide in Missouri Star Quilt, okay? Yeah. Um, I think that for a lot of, I want to focus on the smaller downtowns, the ones that might be more problematical, uh, the, the towns that uh, are not going to have the wealthy um, 60K um, remote worker or dominated uh, or suburban creatives, uh, millennial types in there, um, but um, some of the other ones that have been languishing beforehand. And uh, I think that one of the, of the lessons that um, has been emerging uh, before the crisis, I know we at Danth have been advocating this for about the last five years, is that uh, downtown leaders have to encourage their workers to become their, their store owners to be much more adept at, at uh, omni-channel kinds of marketing, and uh, and to have, and that means that you not do not depend so much just on the people coming in through your front door, but you also go after people through the back door, like business to business type sales or sales away from you know like at social events. You know how does a Carvel guy make a living in the winter? Well, what he does is he sells all his ice cream to the school cafeterias, okay? Um, you, you've got to th get people thinking more about that. And an extension that, if you want to call it electronic backdooring, is uh, selling online. Now, uh, Mike and I are going to get into it soon on this, maybe or whatever. But, um, uh, you know, we have examples of it. For instance, Dodds is a shoe store in... Uh, in Laramie, Wyoming, town of 32,000. Uh, Dodds, the owner there, he won't tell me exactly, didn't tell me how exactly how much he's, he was making out of this, but uh, uh, I, I don't think I would be wrong to say that probably around 40 to 60% of his total sales comes from his internet, okay? Um, and uh, uh, others uh, are, uh, you, you have to scale their internet presence to what their abilities are. Uh, you know, some uh, uh, stores uh, should, there was a toy store in, in, in Donald's Grove who did it very sensibly. They didn't offer a wide range of goods, but just a select range of goods, because that allowed them to handle their whole uh, uh, keeping the inventory online uh, up to date and, and the shipping, the internal shipping costs, never mind the external shipping costs, okay? Uh, but uh, the other th thing is that sometimes you get in companies that can be quite uh, um, successful. Uh, they reach markets that are well beyond the traditional uh, 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 close in uh, uh, residential markets. Uh, Missouri Star Quilt is in a town of 1700 and, and you know, very rural Missouri. It sells things that people make to put together to, 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 for quilts. It, uh, last time I looked, it had sales of, you know, 20 millions uh, a year. It has a very substantial um, uh, um, retail presence and sales. And it's, you know, it has, sends out thousands of packages da daily. All of its orders come in. But what is happening has become so popular that it has drawn busloads of traffic coming back to the small downtown. So what has developed in return is a hospitality response. It's now involved in at least three restaurants. And last time I, I, I heard they were thinking about building a hotel. Some variant of this uh, uh, should be looked at in many of these towns. 
you know, a lot of them have um, some kind of what I call consumer manufacturing, consumer related kind of manufacturing plant. And to get that plant either relocate down the downtown or to have a presence on the downtown uh, um, it can be can help build up interest in the downtown. The people are coming through and make it a, a real more robust uh, retail uh, offerings. Um, and also, it, it, they usually have a very strong uh, uh, also uh, 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 um, online uh, uh, presence. Uh, so uh, I, I think that that more um, you know you know the crafts uh, arts uh, are other plays off of this than small towns. Uh, enable them to reach larger uh, um, uh, market areas. And a third component is, you know, uh, of, of some of these, like a, a, uh, a, a chocolate manufacturer, candy manufacturer in Laramie, uh, just not only sell in town or online, they go to trade fairs all, all, over the, all over the country and they sell their products to other stores. <clears throat> so they appear like in 30 other stores ar around the country. These are the kinds of things of thinking about getting beyond your local area, if possible. If you have the right assets that can be leveraged and looking toward that, I think is a, is a key thing. A third thing uh, I want to get into is what I call capturing. You have to go kind of fast now because we're running out of time. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll leave it at that, okay. We'll have time at the end probably to fit in, to fit in some more comments. Uh, Christian, uh, Kristen, or, or Mike, um, who wants to add in? I'd love to step in. Go ahead, oh, go ahead Mike, if you want. Yeah. I, I was going to say I have all kinds of responses, but to stick to the question, and I would like to address the questions that were asked in the chat because um, I have I have ideas there. But um, related to the programs that local leaders can um, can do to realize these potentials, um, we shared a blog on our website. Um, redevelopment-resources.com in July about five keys to rural resilience. And, you know, focusing on business retention is the first thing. If you're a practitioner in a community um, that has retailers that are struggling or thriving, you, you need to get to know them, get to know what they need. Um, make sure they know you're their first point of contact when they have a need. Um, so you can connect them with technical resources or financial resources. Um, foster a sense of community. Uh, it was really interesting during the pandemic that the people, local people wanted to support local businesses. They really had a sense of wanting to support the retailers and the restaurants in their community. So um, fostering that sense of community, um, we, we talked to a municipal staff person who shared that their community did not lose one business during the pandemic. Um, and he attributed that to the connectedness and support supportiveness that the community bestowed on its businesses during that time they just were there for each other and if there's anything you can do to foster that that would be fabulous um design a safety net whether it's with technical services technical support networking financial resources um create networking opportunities for existing businesses amongst each other and then for the public um, and identify one business champion. If there is one person that can be a champion for the businesses, um, I'm trying to go through this rather quickly, but whether it's through the chamber or through the economic development office, um, there's no perfect model and every community is going to be different. Um, maybe it's you as the economic development practitioner or the bid district manager, the main street manager, um, somebody that knows what's going on and somebody that other retailers can point to as who has an answer or could point someone in the right direction. Um, related to, and, and I'll just stop there on this question and then we can go into the answering the questions in the chat and I'll let Mike share his points. Mike, you're on, on the rush here uh, so go ahead it's me okay chris no great um great stuff Kristen. I, um you know I, and and there's so many good questions in the chat which really get into the nuts and bolts of this i wish i could uh, or i wish we could cover them all um you know what i was going to say though some of the questions in the chat were about how do we attract those businesses in the tic-tac-toe that Kristen put up um you know how, and you know i think that um you know, so many, so many communities want to get into the business of recruitment. Um, you know, I, and I think that, you know, 
not all of them should be getting into that business. Some, some it does make sense, others maybe not so much. Uh, but I think on a broader level, part of recruitment is the notion of marketing. And um, way too many communities don't really say anything in their marketing. Um, uh, the one that I hear most often, not that it isn't true, is communities, when I ask them what's special about this place, what's different, they say it's a great place to raise a family, which it might very well be. And no doubt that is very appealing, especially for people looking to buy a house, for instance. Um, when it comes to retail, that pitch doesn't necessarily resonate to the same degree. And more to the point, it doesn't say anything special. There's a concept in marketing called a unique selling proposition. How are you different? How are you differentiated? Um, and you know, I think in, in, in our line of work, the impulse is always, well, well, we could differentiate ourselves by going out and getting something that's out there. And I think especially with smaller towns, sometimes the answer is right in your backyard. One of the most touching stories I've read, um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Chip and Joanna Gaines from HGTV's home, Fixer Upper. And they um, um, basically turned Waco Waco, Texas, a small city in Texas, um, from a place that where people thought about um, Branch Davidians to a place where people think about Magnolia Market. And they, they turned it into a tourist destination. Um, and when, Joanna, when Chip and Joanna Gaines first opened Magnolia Market in downtown Waco, um, uh, it, it, for, for those of you who know about this, it's, it's centered on two big cotton silos, right? And when they first bought the property, uh, the city wanted them to paint the silos, make them look all shiny. And Joanna Gaines said, but why would we do that? They're beautiful the way they are. And now everyone agrees. When she first said that, People thought she was crazy. It was sitting right there in their backyards. What's special about a place? What that unique selling proposition could be? Um, whether it's Waco with Magnolia Market, whether it's Pahuska with, in Oklahoma with Reed Drummond's Pioneer Woman, whether it's Creedy in Colorado with the Creedy Repertory Theater, whether it's one of my favorites, Whiting, Illinois, which is now the home of the Mascot Hall of Fame. Um, these are all things that are right there in your backyard. Right, and they're different. They're a unique selling proposition. Um, last thing I'll say about this: uh, thinking of the community of Emporia, Kansas, about fifteen thousand people big, it's between Kansas City and Wichita. And when they were thinking twenty years ago about how to revitalize their downtown, um, their first impulse was to go to Kansas City and find some retailers. Well, not surprisingly, that didn't work, right? Because if I'm a retailer in Kansas City, uh, I'm looking to open in Chicago. I'm not looking to open in Emporia when I'm thinking about the hierarchy, right? Uh, and what I aspire to as a merchant, right? If I'm expanding, I'm probably going up the food chain, right? What Emporia then realized was, okay, that tax is not going to necessarily work. What they didn't said was they focused on what Kristen was getting at, the, the whole notion of an entrepreneurial platform where we don't know what the next great idea is going to be. We don't, we don't know what the next Magnolia Market or Mascot Hall of Fame is going to be, right? But we got to create the platforms from which they can emerge. Um, and those platforms need to have all the right supports, whether it's technical assistance, whether it's funding from community banks. Um, and, 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 and so what Emporia did was they worked with Emporia State University, their local college, um, on those platforms. And 20 years later, downtown, certainly before COVID, um, and as far as I know, still today, uh, is a much more vibrant place with a lot of, of businesses that emerged from those platforms, right? Um, and so my larger point is when you think about marketing and how to find these tenants, yeah, there's direct recruitment. And in some cases, that makes sense, right? Um, but in a lot more cases, those, those ideas, those ideas that are really going to differentiate you, they're right here at home, uh, hiding in plain sight, uh, just like Joanna Gaines saw in Waco. 
And um, not only can that be inspiring, but also it can be, um, uh, you know, it can, it, it can create quite a bit of, of vitality uh, from a business perspective. Um, so uh, um, I could say more about that, but I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Lori, can you put the last slide on? The very last slide, the uh, book slide. We only have about the 20 minutes left. You're hanging in there. I appreciate it very much. Um, I'm going to give you an award for those that can uh, stick on a little bit longer. Uh, the first uh, two people that, uh, that uh, submit a question by voice uh, will re receive the book, Shaping a City, which was written by Mac Travis and launched this webinar series back in the spring. And uh, it's a wonderful book about a small city in upstate New York where, uh, where through housing and, and the creative thinking and involving the community through a strategic planning process and forming a bid, made this town a, a, a tough, tough town in the 1960s to a place today that's very vibrant and active and now the gateway to upstate New York as a, a vibrant city. So uh, we have this book available for you for, for uh, people that want to uh, learn about this upstate city and we'll go from there. But right, right now I'd like to focus back on the, the questions at hand and uh, focus on uh, the uh, chats that have come in. And so can I have uh, Lori or uh, Brandon read the chats so that uh, we can... Um, Yep, uh, but first, Bill, we have Don who raised her hand, so she was oh quick to raise the hand. So Don, the first book winner. Oh, this is Don Filmini. I'm at Colorado State University in Fort Collins, and um, I, I wonder. And I, I got on late because I had another meeting. But did you bring up any examples of where the concern about affordable housing and downtown development could be blended, um, given the agenda? Um, we in Colorado are really facing this where we actually have become a place a lot of people want to move and live, but they were having some affordability issues. So be interested about that perspective. Good point, Dawn. Thank you. Panel? We, we briefly touched on the value of making sure upper story residential is fully utilized. I agree, though, that housing of any kind in a downtown is going to be beneficial. And so if you have... Um, any vacant land that would support new construction of multifamily. Um, I think that would be, I, I think it's always good to get a mix of residential and retail um, in a downtown. Um, there was another question on the chat about bellwethers or non-traditional anchors. And I think that, you know, we met with um, Sandpoint, Idaho several years ago, and we were in, in downtown Sandpoint. And the question is what should go downtown or what shouldn't go downtown? And I said, everything should go downtown. But the reason I said that is because there was a local community college that was looking to extend a branch downtown. And I thought, what would that would be phenomenal to have education downtown. So um, Don, I, I guess when you say affordable housing, are you thinking um, high density multifamily? Um, I don't think, you know, you're not gonna put single family residential in your downtown. Um, so depending on the available land or your opportunity to do redevelopment in buildings, maybe there's a large building that could be redeveloped into apartments. Um, well, and the other two things that keep coming up, particularly vacant lots are um, tiny homes have gotten really big here, although this is a pretty cool place to try to pull those off. And then, um, you know, beyond mobile homes, you know, manufactured homes really have gotten to be quite a bit higher quality. So the those are two of the alternatives we're hearing beyond that upper story um, downtown above retail. Those are the other two things because we, again, like most cities have either vacant lots or some um, parking lots that seem fairly underutilized. Sure. If they're not right on Main Street, I would say there's some really neat component or con they're like container or modular homes that can be stacked. Um, I can't think of Indie Dwell is a company that does this. Um, we were looking at that as an option in southwestern Colorado when we were working with some communities there. Um, I would, I, I, it, it ends up looking like high density multifamily, but these indie dwell units may or may may be a little less expensive. Um, the the trick with affordable housing right now is um, to make it affordable to the end user. It has to be profitable to the. Um, developer and builder and that's that's where it's so difficult right now you know um this is a whole nother webinar really <laughs> uh, 
I, I hate to say this, but Bill and I did some research on housing in seven Midwest states. We looked at 250 some odd cities with populations between 25,000 and 70,000. And the conclusion we reach really is that there seems to be really a lot, a lot of these cities, a cultural kind of um, preference for single family homes and not attached housing. That's just what the culture is. And that there's really a, a, a few market segments that are, can be relied on for going downtown. And um, um, seniors and empty nesters are, are one. Young, young people who are uh, 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 unnest, not nested yet, uh, and, and people who are looking for less expensive housing going into units that are, have, are, that are you know, a market, have, mar, mar, have rents that are, that are at, that, at that level. And so the, you know, the issue about affordability is, is really um, uh, you know, a critical one of you know, who, who are you gonna get to fill these houses? Who are you gonna get to build them? And um, so in these, in these towns, downtown housing may be a, a, a rougher thing to get. The other thing is I really strongly uh, would recommend that you don't choose sites on, on any card of where you're gonna find the property is more expensive and, and, and go for, you know, mixed use. As long as they're within a, a 10 minute walk of the downtown, the downtown can benefit of them. And the, the developers all over, you know, are kind of rebelling about these first floor having a have commercial or retail because, uh, you know, where are they gonna find the tenants and, and their new construction. So they're gonna have to pay higher rents. Uh, so, you know, off, or within within ten minute walk of downtown helps the downtown. Uh, not going for um, a, a mixed use maybe I hate to say this maybe in these towns the way to go. Anyone else? I have things to say, but I figure let's stick to retail because we could have a whole another <laughs> webinar in housing. I think. Okay. Okay, another uh, the voice call or a or a t uh, text. What? Can Brandon bring up another voice call or a text message? Yep, uh, I will. Um, I'll just ask a question. So please feel free to unmute yourself and interrupt if you would like to ask a question. Um, I know we did talk a little bit about this, um, and to Kristen, your the tic tac toe that Michael referred to of the different uh, mixed, use, uh, mixed uses that you could bring into the downtown. There were two questions related to suggestions on how you get these nine categories to come downtown. And then specifically a follow-up question relating to how do you get a, a mix of them as opposed to having like one type of business um, overrun the downtown. So I guess, um, in, oh. sorry, you go, this, you go this time, Mike, you go you first. Sure, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, I, th I, I would be, I'm a little cautious about getting too prescriptive about a mix um, because um, beauty as in the form of your ideal tenant mix is in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> um, it's, it's all very subjective. A good example is hair salons, right? Uh, routinely work, and I'm sure David's gonna be with me on this, I routinely work in downtowns where there's complaints about having too many hair or nail salons. Um, and even setting aside the question uh, that, that David implicitly posed that, you know, these are traffic drivers oftentimes, um, uh, you know, what is to say that there's too many hair and nail salons, what is that based on? Um, in your mind, there's too many hair and nail salons? Uh, obviously, um, there are a lot of entrepreneurs who want to open hair and nail salons, and especially with hair and nail salons, that is a use which actually, and this doesn't get much attention, serves in certain communities as a third place. Um, it's not just there uh, for your purely profit-driven reasons, right? Um, so it's my point is, lar is largely that, you know, I don't think we want to get too into the weeds about what the precise mix should be. 
Uh, I think we do have cause for concern when one mix does seem to be pretty much overwhelming any other. You see that most with food and beverage, um, which can have the effect of driving rents uh, to levels that just simply can't be sustained by other, other users. Um, also, it leaves your downtown very, very vulnerable um, in that it's, it's, it's not diversified when there are shocks to the system, like, I don't know, a pandemic. Um, you know, so I think we do have cause for worry when it gets to be too much of any one thing. But beyond that, I, I think it gets to be kind of dangerous to start getting too prescriptive about what kind of mix you, you would want. The, the, the other thing that I would want to say too, um, uh, and this is more of a general comment, is, is we're talking about a lot of the other uses um, that feed retail, right? Whether it's housing, whether it's public space. And I know malls are on the wane in this country. Um, I get that. But I always feel that malls are perhaps the purest distillation of retail site location theory, such that downtowns can learn a lot of things from how malls have been historically conceived, programmed, and designed. Specifically, when you look at a mall, what's on the ends? the anchors, right? Because the whole idea is that people will walk between the anchors past everything else, right? Back when department stores actually were anchors, that was the idea, right? We don't have department stores in downtowns anymore, um, but what we do have are other sorts of anchors, whether it's public spaces, whether it's large residential complexes, whether it's large office complexes, whether it's a performing arts center, um, whether it's a little community theater, uh, whether it's the sports mascot hall of fame, whatever. And I know David, you said that, well, those should be sent, you know, your public space in particular should be centrally located. To me, I'm almost like, well, I'd rather kind of thread the needle. Yeah, it needs to be central enough, but just enough so that it creates those anchors on the ends so that you get people walking between them. So all of these kind of feeders to retail, I think they're best located just like the department stores were in places which will enable that kind of flow in between so that people will pass all of the shops and the restaurants in between, right? Um, and, and I think that's a way of thinking about this which is often not really considered in downtown planning, for instance, um, to think about it like a mall developer would, all right? Um, even if that's distasteful in other ways, there are certain useful lessons which downtown can take from how a mall developer would think about siting um, and traffic flow. Um, so just I, wanted I to add that. I'd just like to chime in about the niche thing, uh, seeing as I've devoted a lot of my life to it. Um, that uh, successful downtowns with niches usually have th about three niches, not just one. And, uh, you know, uh, I, the whole thing about niche theory, it goes against having some kind of ideal retail mix. In fact, it, it, it rejects it, 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 it and, I mean, and says it's almost impossible to, to come up with, as you say, a, 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 what that should be. And uh, it usually is, a, is an extreme failure. Uh, Mike, I, I think your idea about um, having some thing, um, um, uh, the, the anchors being spread apart uh, is, is an interesting one. But I, I, first thing that comes to my mind is, you know, how do you set the distance? Because the, the thing in downtowns is that it gets too large. And, and what I usually find is that uh, in downtown revitalization efforts are opportunistic and they don't cluster enough to get a critical mass together to build off of okay now you know to to idea you know to have the idea of a node okay two nodes that are correctly planned out i think that that's an intriguing one but i've never seen that proposed before and you know what the walking distance should be and then i think the, the mall would be a good model but i think it happens kind of haphazardly and usually at the infill does not occur and it's wasted. And I think downtown Phoenix and, the, and, and the, 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 um, a, lot, a lot of the uh, development around uh, uh, the downtown of Phoenix was based on that premise that, you know, you get two major anchors at, uh, and there would be infill. I, I remember back in the 1970s, pardon me for 
going back that far. Uh, they were they were talking about you know the uptown and the downtown downtown uh, in in Phoenix, which they since did away with because it never came anywhere close to you know to to, to coming together. I've got a question here, unless there's one in the chat, Brandon. Uh, no, go for it. Okay, a uh, real quick, uh, a re really important topic we might have missed today, and that is e-commerce and how that impacts a small town. I'm thinking in terms of e-commerce, multi-channel marketing, experiential retail, um, some of these major trends that are happening worldwide. Do the small towns and the small businesses have the wherewithal to be, be able to do some of these things, or is it uh, more just talk? Well, one thing I wanted to, oh, sorry, Kristen, you talked, me and David just was laughing. <laughs> well, I guess I mean, to clarify, Bill, um, are they talking about local retailers competing on a worldwide stage or are they talking about, I guess, can you say the question again? Well, it seems like they're trying to, uh, many are, want to adapt some of the uh, principles and concepts of, of e-commerce in their business. Sure. But, uh, experiential retail like Amazon with the, the, the checkout uh, less cashier, you know, um, that costs money, technology, investment that small businesses don't have. So uh, are we going to be kind of skipping a lot of that as, as we move ahead of the pandemic here and uh, not follow some of those trends? Or do we need to adapt and, uh, and respond to what the big players are doing worldwide? I think there are um, affordable options for businesses to compete in e-commerce. Um, but I guess, you know, as one, one way to sell, they still, you know, still want to have a storefront. Um, I guess I, I don't have a solid answer to that. I guess the, the focus being focused on the downtown and what can, what can be successful there. Um, I would recommend any retailer that comes into a downtown, no matter how small the town is to have an online option, even if it's just to serve their local customers. Um, there was a purchase, there was a um, pet store in a community or a pet supply store in a community that was downtown and they had a serious problem with parking. Um, people didn't want to buy a 40 pound bag of dog food and haul it around the corner or across the street or down the block to their car. So they thought that their, only, their customers only would shop there if they could park right out front. And I thought if that, if that business really used their online shopping in an effective way, they would encourage the, the buyer to buy the dog food and then either text or call them when they were driving by and they could stop or tell the shop owner where they're parked and the shop should take the dog food to their car. Instead of making parking the problem, they should find a, a customer service related solution, whether it be through um, technology or you know, marketing customer service. So um, I think I'll, I'll let Mike and David chime in here. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's, um, I, I'm sure everyone at this point is, is familiar with Shopify, which is kind of the anti Amazon, which is, is basically positioned itself as, as, as the company that will help small businesses, um, not only create an online presence, but, but really kind of, uh, elevate it. Um, but, you know, I think um, what's interesting is that the data suggests that online penetration is actually uh, lower in rural markets than it is in urban ones. Um, and where, you know, I, I won't get into all of it, but certainly one of the biggest costs about e-commerce is, is shipping. And that cost grows still further when it comes to smaller towns and rural areas. And, you know, when someone has to pay for shipping, that has an enormous impact on their willingness to buy online. And I just think even if it's not happening now, the writing's on the wall. At some point, businesses are gonna to have to start recouping some of those costs, uh, especially in rural markets. Um, and you know, so, so I think um, what I think we could end up seeing interestingly, is, is, is what you're already seeing in other countries, like, for instance, India, where retailers, um, whether they are online only uh, or whether they're, you know, clicks and bricks, are realizing that to, that to reach these, these, rural, these, these small towns and rural areas, they need local partners. They need small businesses on the ground in these communities that can hold their merchandise and then provide a place for pickup 
right? Because it's just not cost effective for a retailer that's located in another state to be shipping to all of these rural areas. Amazon is doing that here. Amazon has got a variant of that with, no, their, lockers, with, their, with lockers. their lockers. Yes, with their lockers. But in, um, but they haven't so I'd really- I'd like to move on to another question if we could. Okay, sure. Can, uh, I, Joe, can, Joe I, can, I, can I chime in on this? Well, and, and, yeah, okay. Go, go let's, Dave. Let's let Joel have a word here first. Uh, yes, you. I'm a Joel West, city administrator in a small town in Wisconsin, St. Croix Falls, and wanted to see if you had any uh, comments or examples of utilizing public art in the downtown as a way to, you know, encourage uh, more visitors and a unique experience. It would, our thoughts would be, it would be public art that would change periodically uh, to increase uh, customer interest. Good question, Joel. Good question. I I could say something, but. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah, Ken Stapleton from Florida just uh, pointed to Wynwood in Miami, which is a particularly good example of that. But, you know, even in smaller towns, you know, right now I'm working in, um, in downtown Plymouth, Massachusetts, um, which you probably are familiar with as the home of the rock. You know, they, they advertise themselves as America's hometown. Um, but they're also on the water, and they're kind of a, that quaint sort of seaside New England village. And part of their experience, they actually developed a series of, of basically uh, human being sized scallop shells, um, which were each designed and painted by local artists. And there were 29 fiberglass scallop shells spread across downtown. Um, and they called it the, you know, the, um, the scallop roll. Right. And before that, they had the lobster pole, same idea. And what it did was twofold. One, um, people started taking tours, especially parents with kids, and obviously snapping selfies and posting them on social media. But also, it served as a sort of informal wayfinding system um, because it was on a map and um it was you know and so people would go to each one and it kind of served that same purpose as those department stores right it led everyone through the entirety of the downtown and past all of the businesses right and so that was a way of public art not just becoming a destination itself but also as a as a driver of foot traffic across the full sweep of the downtown um and that was just a particularly uh, intriguing and, and, and place appropriate form of public art, um, which I could send you more information on if you're interested. I love I love it when downtown Sturgeon Bay does their, um, they'll do a cherry or a sturgeon or something and every artist has a chance to decorate one and those will be on display. I love that. Also, I think it's Greenville, North Carolina or South Carolina that has the little brass mice, either brass mm -hmm. or copper, and they're the little mice that are hidden throughout the downtown and the people have to go on a scavenger hunt to find them. I love that idea because they're cute little um, molten metal mice, then they're, they're adorable. They're all in different positions and shapes and sizes, mostly the same size, but a small, and they're, they're hidden. And so it creates a scavenger hunt. So you can do some really creative things with public art, Joel. I think that's, that's a great way to encourage visitors and for, to encourage residents to discover different things about the community in a different way. Thank you, panel. Thank you, Joel. And Joel, we'll send you a copy of the book. Okay, thank you. So it's about uh, one minute before the end of, end of the show here. Um, we've got uh, 84 people still on, and we thank you very much for being part of this discussion today. Uh, we're going to make ourselves available to you uh, for the next few minutes here online. Um, but um, you can also contact us by my email on the last page of the, of the uh, handout that I think you have. Um, and we can get back to you and put you in contact with one of our great speakers today. So thanks so much for attending, and uh, keep up the good work, and um, we'll see you next time.